This podcast may not be suitable for young listeners. Steve Lilly, journal entry number 12. Steel mills rise out of the northeast Arkansas Delta like giant mechanical roaring monsters from a mysterious steampunk fantasy. An area that was once so poor, every kid born there wanted out by the age of 10. Only 300 years before that, ancient forests towered with timber and wetlands uninhabitable by humans other than the native people who figured out a way to live there for centuries. When the white man arrived, he saw a fortune could be made from the fertile soil, and they cleared the land for agriculture. The once beautiful greens and browns of the forests slowly turned to deserts where cotton, beans, and rice provided their own unique colors during the growing season, only to turn to a desolate, dystopian landscape made up of dead cotton plants and mud in the winter months. I compare the landscape to a desert, but even deserts have hills. The slightest rise in elevation is absent in the delta. You can climb a 12-foot ladder there and see everything around you for 10 miles. In this flat-as-a-pancake landscape, steel mills stand out. They really are a remarkable vision and testament to modern man's innovation. Huck Johnson and I know a few of the men who work these mills. Through our years of hunting the Delta region, we've become acquainted with other guys who like to do what we do. It's not uncommon after a hard day of hunting or fishing to walk into a local beer joint and find others like yourself. Friendships are made and phone numbers exchanged. Later, invitations to hunt happen. Details are ironed out in 30 seconds or so. The next day, we become Arkansas Delta duck hunters. Well, on this day, we were hunting with them in an Arkansas WMA located about 50 miles from the big river. It was the start of this crew's four-day weekend. We had two boats and eight of us sat with blinds concealing our movements. The boats were tied together side by side under a makeshift canopy or a blind they had constructed earlier in the season. None of it really mattered on this day. It was warm. The skies were once again blue and had no clouds, with only a slight breeze coming out of the south. It was a perfectly pathetic day to hunt ducks. Well, that being the case, most of us were not paying attention to the sky looking for ducks. We could have and should have packed up and headed home, but we were having such a good time talking that we all stayed. Plus, one of these boys brought a hibachi grill and was about to cook us some venison right there in the boat. And this is how this Bigfoot killing adventure began. One of the guys in the boat mentioned a dog that had wandered into the mill. Hook and I love dogs and our ears perked up. Has that dog in the mill weaned her puppies yet? Somebody asked. Yep, they're running all over the break room. We've been feeding them real good, said another. Best fed dogs in Arkansas, said a third. Hook and I asked about the dog, and we listened to the story about a small, female, brindle-colored pit bull dog that had wandered into the melt shop. Apparently, dogs wander onto the property often, but this one was looking for a spot that minute to have some puppies. They knew this when she shot through the break room door when it opened and immediately curled up on someone's jacket laying in the floor. And as they watched, the first puppy popped out. Eight blackened faces of men gathered around the dog to make sure this was really happening, and soon all eight were scrambling to gather everything they could find to make this new mama dog happy and comfortable. Towels and t-shirts and other garments were donated from their lockers, and soon this mother began having her litter. And after three hours, eight new puppies were nursing comfortably and warm on the break room floor of that noisy mill. And the melt shop had a new dog to care for. 
She would stay in that break room and wander the property until the men found homes for the puppies. And then the topic changed. Some of the men had seen a strange thing at the mill. From the furnace deck, elevated several feet above the floor, a man could see out the door and across the scrap yard, which was enormous and covered in mountains of scrap, he could see to the stand of trees that separated the mill from the Mississippi River. At first, they thought it was someone from the mill, maybe one of the security people. It was a figure walking on two legs. He was a big man, looked like he had a heavy coat on, they said. He would appear on the bank of the retention pond, pace back and forth, and then stop and scream. None of them could hear the scream due to the noise inside the melt shop, but there was no doubt this person was yelling with all their might. And then the man would vanish on the far side of the dam at the retention pond. One of the hands pointed out to the other, and they discussed how strange that was, and then they went back to work. But over the next two weeks, this man, or men, because sometimes there were two and once three, would appear and wander the knoll and then vanish behind it. The question was asked to other departments. Who was that man or men way out there on the levee in the evenings? Not a single department in the whole company had an answer. Two nights before telling us this story, one of the hands brought a set of field glasses to work. When the people appeared out on the levee, from the furnace deck he raised his glasses to see who the hell this guy was. Darkness had almost set in, but optics these days have great light-gathering abilities. He could see the man like it was daylight. It took a few seconds to bring the field glasses down from his face and hand them to his co-worker. I think he was speechless. His co-worker then made the comment, That's not a man. What the hell is that? Well, I don't know, said the other. Get Matt down here to look at this thing. Matt was the crew's first helper. He's the guy managing the milk crew while at the same time controlling the furnace. He sits in a control room with walls carpeted with monitors all connected to computers. I've seen this control room before. The space shuttle cockpit ain't got shit on this room. After the heat they had been burning was tapped, Matt had three minutes to leave and get back before they loaded the furnace with another charge. He looked through the binoculars, took them down for a brief second, and then returned them to his eyes and watched the man walk off the levee. Looks like a Bigfoot. That's all he said, then he ran off the deck and up the stairs into his space to begin another heat. Bigfoot, one man said over the radio, We don't have time to worry about that shit. I need you to, and Matt barked an order so that he could drop a giant electrode into the fresh pile of scrap. Matt heard them over the radio talking to each other as they worked. The excitement was thick. They had seen a Bigfoot. Matt rolled his eyes and laughed, looking forward to the bullshit he would hear for the next month about the Bigfoot at the mill. And then he went back to work. Hook and I were in my boat. I was sitting on the rear bench. Hook was up front on the bow. But we looked at each other, and I mouthed to him silently, Money! While I made the universal sign for cash by rubbing my thumb against my other fingers. Well, Hook nodded and smiled. After we feasted on venison in the boats and actually killed two mallards that day, we packed it up and headed to the boat ramp. On the bank, I approached Matt and I asked him about the things that he thought were Bigfoot. What makes you think those are Bigfoots, Matt? I asked. What? He looked at me funny and I'm sure wondering how that question came out of left field. I don't think they're Bigfoots, he said. I'm just messing with those guys. They'll think they saw Bigfoot for the rest of their lives. They'll probably tell a thousand people about it. Oh yeah, yeah, I hear you, I said. But do you know for sure what they are seeing? I really don't, said Matt. Best I can figure it's someone trespassing on our property, probably hunting. Eventually our security guards will catch up to him. Well, what if it was a Bigfoot? 
How would it go over if we actually killed one? I said, laughing. If it was a Bigfoot, I'd go out there and kill it myself. I could make some cash and retire, Matt said. Well, that sure would be cool, wouldn't it, Matt? I said. I wanted to get a look at this thing to see what it was, but I was sure it was a damn Squatch. And if there were more than one, Hook and I could make some money. I would even split it with the guys. Hey, Matt, is there any way you can get me in the mill so I can see what this thing really is? Hook and I are staying a few days. We're deer hunting over in central Arkansas for the rest of the week, but we'll be back over this way Friday. Uh, yeah, I can get you in. You'll have to act like a contractor. Everyone in the office will leave early that day so nobody will run you off. Come on by Friday afternoon. We all go to work that morning. Apparently, this thing comes out right before dark. You'll have about 30 minutes to see it if it shows up again. It's not a Bigfoot, though, Steve. It's a big waste of time if you ask me, but it's okay to come and take a look if you want. Matt and his crew loaded up and they left. Hook and I headed to the Ozarks for two days. We would see them all again on Friday. By Thursday evening, Hook and I both had killed a good buck. With the meat on ice, we had no reason to stick around the mountains. We headed east to Blyville and we got a hotel room. Hook is in a motorcycle club, you know, like the Mongols or the Hell's Angels. Hook is a one percenter with friends and other chapters all over the South. He made a phone call and some dudes picked him up. They went off to do their MC club shit. I have no idea what they do, and I don't care. I doubted I'd see Hook again until the next afternoon, though. When he was gone, I got bored. A bar sat across the highway, and after a hot shower, I walked over to get some food and have a beer or two. Now, I never oversleep. There is an internal alarm clock in my brain that wakes me no later than 5 a.m. every morning. But too many beers last night, plus a lack of sleep, must have thrown my brain alarm off because when I woke, the sun was beaming through the drapes. The Waffle House next door was calling my name. I needed some coffee and some food. Across the room, I saw that little brunette I danced with all night. I think her and her friends had stayed out all night. She looked pretty rough. Well, I waved at her, expecting a wave back, but instead... She scowled at me. Well, I wonder what I did last night to piss her off, I thought. The question was answered when she walked to the table and slammed down a piece of paper on the table, almost slopping my coffee in my lap. There was writing on the piece of paper, and the writing looked like mine. This number you gave me last night, it's not really your number, she said. Her face was red. Yep, she was pissed. How about I call it and watch your phone ring, she said. Before I could say a word, she slammed her phone down on the table and she said, listen to this. And with her speaker engaged, I heard the greeting. Jerry's muffler and exhaust, how can I help you? Well, I was busted. I had given that number out to several women through the years and never knew whose it was. Well, now I knew. Every head in the Waffle House was turned toward me. I needed to defuse this situation before someone called the police. I bet your name really isn't Nelson, is it? She screamed. Yep, that's my name, I said. And then I got up with a big smile on my face and laid a $20 bill on the table and I brushed by her and out the door. You are an asshole, was the last word I ever heard that beauty say. You sure got that right, I whispered under my breath. I eased calmly out of the parking lot and pulled out onto Highway 55 and I headed south to Osceola. On the way there, I called Hook to find out where he was. I could hear music playing in the background and I knew he was at the MC Clubhouse. They had probably partied all night and by the sound of it, the party was still going on at 8 the next morning. You have any shit left in your room? I asked. No, it's all in the truck, Hook said. Okay, I'm on my way to the mill. I want to do a little recon before we show at the mill this afternoon. 
Can you get one of your buddies to bring you to? And I looked at my GPS and found an intersection in Osceola. Have them drop you there at three this afternoon, and I'll pick you up before we go to the mill. Sounds good, he said. Try to sober up before then, buddy, I said. I quit drinking last night at midnight. I'm fine, said Hook. See you this afternoon, brother, I said. Forty-five minutes later, I was driving past the gate at the big mill. There wasn't any need to pull in yet. I was just getting familiar with the area. Finally, I figured out which building was the melt shop. This company obviously owned a lot of property. It was all fenced off. But down the road a few hundred yards, I came to a gravel farm road that would take me to the south end of the eternal chain link fence and I could work my way back to the river. Straight in front of me, maybe a mile ahead, I could see a levee. It was the big levee. Behind that was a big stand of timber. That had to be where the Squatches lived. There were no other woods for miles other than where the trees had been left to grow along the ditch banks. This is where they were. Once on top of the levee, I got out and I looked around. The timber started at the bottom of the levee on the riverside. The trees went as far as I could see to the south. And to the north, I followed the steel mill fence with my eyes. The fence came over the levee and then cut back north. I couldn't see all the way to the end, but it appeared the fence went back east and probably terminated at the river. The fence followed the edge of the timber, and if these were squatches, the fence would be torn down at some point, and if I could find that, I knew we were in the money. Halfway to the river, and at the spot on the fence closest to the timber, I found the section laid to the ground. A post had been shoved down flat, and in the middle of that section of fence, a trail of squatch tracks were worn in the mud, and it looked as if they were making trips into this area daily. The question in my mind was why? After following the trail several hundred feet and almost to a small retention pond levee where the melt shop crew had seen the creatures, I saw why they liked this area. A shallow depression was full of water, and in this water were thousands of crawfish. Squatches will gorge themselves on crawfish when they can find a good source. They will stay on crawfish areas for days until they eat every living thing in the water. They're very destructive. Back at the truck, I called my handlers and asked if they had any reports from the area and specifically this location. Within a minute, a voice came back on the line. Yes, there's activity in the area. A report was filed just last week on a sighting. We picked this up on one of the internet Bigfoot sites. We can't determine if it's a hoax or not. Someone from a steel mill in the area has had multiple sightings along the river. I can forward the details if you need them. No need for that, I said. I heard the report straight from the source. Anything else? Nothing we can tie specifically to squatch activity. We know they're there. You can pull up the sat image to see for yourself. There are four unsolved missing person cases at this time in that county. All the missing were reported to be close to the river. Looks like there were two bird watchers and two hunters, all gone missing at different times. I would say we have a problem clan there. Good work getting to this before we did. All the intel will be on your laptop in 60 seconds. You are clear to engage and terminate the clan if the opportunity is there. With my computer in my lap, I pulled up the live satellite images of the area. A mile north of my location and in the middle of this patch of woods, I saw three images. It was now 1.30 in the afternoon. The sun was bright. These squatches were asleep in their nest. You know that because they're horizontal. If you can see arms and legs, that means they're laying down. Three would not be a problem, especially if they were coming to this crawfish pond every night. We could set up on these dumbasses and catch them all unaware as they came through the fence. I panned out on the screen to make sure that I had not missed a century. 
I wanted to get this whole patch of woods in the screen. Maybe a heat signature would show, but it would be faint with this much area covered. I didn't see anything, but I also lost the signature on the three I had seen asleep. So I zoomed in a bit and got their images back again. Then I started panning the wood slowly with the keypad mouse. Ten minutes later, not seeing anything, I made the assumption this clan was confident that they had not been detected and no centuries were needed. But just as I got to the area in front of me, a red image shone bright. That son bitch was right in front of me. I could see my truck right there only a short distance away. He had been there the whole time watching me. Now there's only a few times in my career as a Bigfoot hunter that I've gotten the shivers. Well, I got them this time. I was being careless. and Thank God I hadn't gone into the woods without checking the satellite. Now, I'm not saying he would have gotten me, but he could have, and I didn't like that feeling. Well, I pinched my fingers and zoomed in on him, and I watched him. He was in a tree. I could see his head move back and forth. He was only 20 yards into the tree line. Well, I thought about going in and taking him now, but that would bust up the whole day. We had four sure kills right there, and if the other three heard me shoot, they wouldn't come to feed this evening. So I left him alone. I'd consult with Hook on this intel and get his input. And I picked the phone up and I called Hook. Are we still on for three o'clock? I said. I'm already here, he said, having a cup of coffee at a little gas station at the intersection. On my way. Hook and I were headed to the mill. I called Matt to make sure we were still on for the Bigfoot viewing. He said the guard would let me in the gate. On the drive, Hook and I devised a plan that would bag all the squatches, hopefully at one time. Quick in and out. We would worry about explaining to the melt shop crew later. It didn't matter what we said. If they told the story to anyone, they'd be dismissed as a lunatic. The price at that time was $7,500 a head. This was going to be a $30,000 payday. and We'd split it with the guys in the melt shop. Before I drove Hook to the levee, I checked the satellite image to see if the sentry was still there. If he was, this was going to be a problem. We would have to make some changes to the plan and figure out a way to take him out silently. But luck was on our side, though. The lookout Squatch must have gotten bored because he was moving back to the nest. All four Squatches were up and moving. They were hungry after a long nap. Hook jumped out of the truck on the levee and made his way to the damaged fence. From there, he would move in and set up in a stand of scrub brush growing right at the edge of the river bluff. He carried his AR-10 with several 20-round mags. He would set up behind the crawfish pond and I'd come at them from the scrapyard. The plan was for me to distract him while he opened fire. The field was open. The woods were a good distance away making them great targets should they make a run for the trees. But all plans fall apart when unforeseen elements enter the stage, and that's exactly what happened on this night. But I don't want to get ahead of myself just yet. The man in the guard shack called Matt on his radio. Matt said to let me in. Matt didn't know I had dropped Hook out earlier and told the guard there were two of us. So I just told the guard my co-worker had called in sick. Okay, drive all the way to the end of the building and make your way around the back, he said. You see that tower above the roof right in front of us? That's the melt shop. The big door's always open on the back. Park outside and walk on in, but don't block access to that door. I nodded and I went that way. Matt stood just inside the building in the massive door to the melt shop. It was the loudest place I've ever been in. I looked past Matt and watched the most spectacular thing happen I had ever seen. One huge electrode was slowly dropping into a giant bucket. The men standing close to the furnace looked like insects in comparison. This thing was huge. It sounded like a war. I don't even know what makes it so loud, but it shook me up. Matt never flinched. 
He and his crew went through the process 15 to 20 times a day on every shift, and the noise never let up. It's louder than hell in there, I screamed at Matt. Let's go outside, he said. Outside, I could hear a little better. Look, I can't let you inside. It's pretty dangerous in there, he said. Well, that's fine with me. I never seen anything like this. It's amazing to me you fellas do this for a living. Knowing you boys worked at the mill was one thing, but seeing it happen, that's another experience altogether. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, but you get used to it, said Matt. The money's too good not to do this, so we just try to stay alive and pump as much steel out the door as we can. I didn't know what to say. My eyes were locked on the big fire monster across the floor of the shop. Matt broke my stare into the building. If those guys out on that levee show up, it should have many time now. This is the time of day we see them every night. I looked in the direction of the crawfish pond and I couldn't see over the piles of scrap. And then I looked back into the building and I saw guys walking on a deck over the furnace doing something dangerous. That's the elevation they needed to see that far. Otherwise, they would have never noticed these squatches. If you want to get closer so you can see, Steve, we have ATVs. There's one right there. Matt pointed down the building. Don't drive your vehicle out there. You'll get a flat. Tires on the ATVs are foam filled. I'll bring you a hard hat and some earplugs. You have to wear those on this property or a safety manager might stop you. Other than that, go see your Bigfoot. I got a hard hat and ear protection in my truck. I'll head out there now. If I see anything, I'll call you. How about that? Sounds good. Enjoy your night, Steve, Matt said laughing. I pulled the ATV up to the back of my truck and I dropped my AR-10 across the seat. Then I closed the topper over the bed of my truck. On the building, I saw cameras all along the eave line. They had to have been 75 feet up in the air. We were being filmed and they just caught me throwing a rifle in one of their ATVs. I wasn't sure what implications this had, but it was too late now. I mainly hoped this didn't get Matt in trouble. This whole thing wasn't worth him losing his job for letting me in on the yard. But again, the damage had already been done. Might as well move forward. I weaved my way along the pass between the piles of scrap. The huge machinery was scooping up buckets full of the stuff and racing back to wherever the charging bucket was located. They paid me no mind. To them, I was just another hand doing something in the scrapyard. Finally... After getting lost in the spider web of roads in the scrapyard, I could see the levee forming the bank of the pond. It was 30 minutes before dark, and it was cool, wasn't a cloud in the sky, and just at the crest of the knoll, I saw a big dark head moving up and down. And then it fully appeared on top of the levee. This was a big one. He stared at the giant fire monster inside the mill like he wanted to fight it, but he never made his roar this time. I clicked my mic and I called for Hook. Are you set up? I asked. I've been here for 30 minutes watching these things wait around in the pond, waiting to hear from you, said Hook. I'm 50 yards from the pond. I got one standing on the bank. I can't see the others, I said. I see him, said Hook. You take big boy on the bank and I'll take out the three digging in the pond. You ready? Well, I wasn't ready. I needed to get a bead on this thing in front of me. I don't think he could see me, which was good. I guess I blended in with the scrap, or if he had seen me, he didn't care. Either way, it never moved when I stepped out of the ranger. Then I rested the rifle on the mirror someone had installed on this ATV, and I clicked my mic. Let me take old big boy out first, I said. When you see him fall, you get to work on the others. Waiting on you is all I got back from Hook. I lined the dot up on the squatch's head and I squeezed one off. That big son of a bitch dropped like a lump of shit. I waited to hear Hook to go to work. And I never heard shots. Something was wrong. I clicked my mic. Are you going to shoot? I'd like to get home by midnight, I said. Hook didn't respond. Hook, buddy, what's up? I tried again. 
The roar of a diesel engine behind me startled me. And I looked back. Headlights were blinding me. I didn't know what was going on. And then I heard Matt's voice. Jump in. Hook's in trouble. And then like an old cowboy, I slung myself into the bed of the pickup truck like I was sliding up on a saddle and I dropped my rifle in the bed to get a better handhold. In the back of the truck with me were two of the Meltan shops and that little mama dog they had taken in. Matt drove straight up the bank and stopped at the top next to the dead Squatch. He looked over at it and shook his head. A hundred yards in front of us stood Hook in the last dim light of the day, and around him were four Squatches. Hook carried this massive bowie knife with him on our excursions. It was great for after-kill butchering. But right then, he was in a standoff, knife in hand, with four squatches doing the best they could to get an angle on him. They were coming at him from behind like a pack of hyenas do in Africa. The big man was too fast for him, though. and When one would come at his back, he would turn and put a deep gash in an arm or a hand. He was holding his own, but they were wearing him down. I looked down to grab my rifle. I wasn't sure how I was going to make a shot with this rifle and not run the risk of hitting Hook, but I had to do something. Things were moving real fast now, and you don't notice details when a stressful situation is in progress, but when I looked up, I watched the dog leap from the truck and tear off toward Hook. One of the guys slid over the edge of the truck bed and yelled, Get him, girl! A brindle flash streaked across Matt's beam of headlights. It was the mama dog heading to give Hook a hand. Matt then maneuvered the truck so that his headlights lit up Hook and his attackers. Just then, the dog latched onto the back of the largest Squatch's leg and would not let go. Hook saw an opening and charged into the beast with a pit bull hanging from its leg, and he shoved that giant bowie knife right into its throat. The creature instantly grabbed his throat, and then he dropped to the ground, and the dog kept gnawing away. By this time, I was halfway to Hook. I had to get closer to take any shots. And then the loud report of a rifle boomed over my head and behind me. Who the hell was shooting now? But I kept running anyway. Hook was out of time. And then another boom zipped over my head. What the hell's going on? I thought as I ran. Now, only a few feet from Hook, I saw only one Squatch squared off with him. Two more Squatches lay dead in the mud. Somebody behind me had a rifle. It's a damn good thing they did. I'm not sure how long Hook would have lasted. I was taking a while to get there. I scooted to the side to make sure I didn't have Hook in my line of fire. I raised my rifle, and I was about to squeeze around into the side of that nasty thing when I heard Hook say, Hold up, Steve, I got this. Huh? Is all I could say. The beast moved in on his target. I still had my rifle ready to shoot, but Hook was about to ruin the shot by being in the way, so it was now or never. Don't you dare shoot this thing, Steve, Hook said, completely out of breath. The beast and Hook faced each other in a standoff. I know Hook Johnson. He wasn't waiting for that thing to come at him. He sidestepped to his right and then juked back to his left, moving forward in the animal space with every step. Before the Squatch knew what was happening, Hook faked with his left hand in the air and came around with that big knife and shoved it in the Squatch's gut. The animal screamed and then seemed confused. It wasn't used to the puny humans being aggressive. The people these things had encountered up until now ran away. This Squatch obviously didn't know what he was dealing with in Hook Johnson. Before the Squatch could react, Hook swung left like he was spinning off a tackler. I think all the guys watching this thought Hook was being tricky with his moves, but he wasn't. That spin gave his right arm centrifugal force. He was building steam, and by the time his right arm swung around, It had to be moving 80 miles an hour or more. The blade slammed into the Squatch's back and Hook drove it to the stop and severed the creature's spine. A loud screech came from the beast as its legs gave out and it flopped to the ground. 
Hook pulled the knife free again as it fell and wound up straddling the beast over its chest. Hook raised the knife above his shoulders and drove it deep into the beast's forehead and then stood up, leaving the knife in the squatch's head. And then I heard one of the melt shop guys whisper, Holy shit, did you see that? I'm standing right here, dumbass. Yeah, I saw it, said another. I didn't say anything for a while. I let Hook catch his breath. He was wet and muddy and covered in squatch blood. He looked like hell. And when he finally gained a little bit of composure, I walked up and said, Come on, ninja. Let's go get you cleaned up. Hook started walking toward me. And he stopped and he went back and pulled his knife out of that squatch's head and then walked past me and everyone standing there. I saw him lean over and pick up his rifle halfway around the pond. I wasn't sure how it got that far away from him, but I assumed that I would know before we got home that day. Hook turned and asked everyone there who was doing the shooting that wasn't Steve's AR. The two shop hands pointed at Matt, who stood off by himself in the dark with a rifle over his shoulder. You saved our lives, Matt, I said. What are you shooting? It's 308, Matt said. Well, I'm glad you were here. Well, I would have been ready ahead of time if you all had told me what you were up to. Lucky I had it in the truck. It's usually in my gun safe at home, said Matt. Damn lucky, I said, and we all walked back to the vehicles. Matt spoke up. Wait a minute. What are we supposed to do with those things laying out there in the field? Hold on, I said. I'll show you. When I'm done here, if your shift is over, let's go grab a beer and I'll explain all this. You have a right to know what just happened. I walked back to the ATV. Hook was standing behind it, wiping the gore off his face. I got to get these heads, I said. Go for it, said Hook. I'm done. You're on your own on this. I'll wait for you here. I jumped in the ATV and headed toward the Squatches. With Hook's bowie, I cut five heads off and dropped them in a tote sack. With that done and the money parts in the bag, I chained the leg of each Squatch, and with the trailer hitch, I drug them to the river bluff. From there, I proceeded to flop them one by one into the churning water below. They all sank and would soon be eaten by catfish and turtles. All the evidence was gone. We could relax and have a few beers and explain to our friends what had just happened. Hook and I got in my truck and the mill hands left in Matt's truck. I bet that conversation in that truck was a good one. Then we all headed for the bar. Hook was too worn out and too nasty to go to the bar. I dropped him at the motel so he could clean up. The place was just across the highway, and he could walk over if he felt like it, but I had a feeling I wouldn't see him till the next day. That boy was running on fumes. On the way to the motel, he told me what had happened and how he wound up without his rifle. We both thought there were only four squatches in this clan. When they appeared in the field, Hook didn't worry about his surroundings. In his mind, All the threats were in front of him. But only seconds after I dropped the big alpha on the pond bank, Hook was about to take out the other four when something grabbed him from behind. It was the fifth squatch that we didn't know anything about. The thing had picked him up and slung him over the bluff and into the river. He was fortunate that the current wasn't strong there, but he said it was deep and he never did find the bottom. Finally, he popped to the surface a few yards down the river, got a foothold in the bluff, and climbed back up. Then he creeped back up the bank, and he looked for his rifle, but he couldn't find it. At that point, he had no sidearm. His comms weren't working, so he couldn't call me. He said he was pissed that they had snuck up on him and pulled out that knife, and walked up to the Squatches, who had not noticed him yet, and he picked a fight. That's about the time we rolled up at the pond bank and lit him and the four remaining squatches up with Matt's headlights. But somewhere in the middle of all that madness, his rifle wound up in the mud next to the crawfish pond. That last one I killed with that knife, said Hook, that was the one that threw me in the river. 
There's no way I was going to let him off the hook with an easy death. I wanted him to know that I was pissed at him. Well, I think he got the message, brother, I said. When I got to the bar, Matt and our other friends had a table way in the back. I sat down and I explained the whole thing to the guys. I talked for 20 minutes. None of them said a word. One of them broke the silence and said, Why haven't you told us this stuff before, Steve? Well, you wouldn't have believed me, would you? I said. Probably not, said Matt. But now you've seen it. There ain't no way to deny what I just told you. Hook and I want to split the pay on this job with you guys. There's no way we could have done it without you. Hell, I don't think either of us would be alive if you fellas hadn't have pitched in. Is that why you cut their heads off? Said one of the hands. Yep, that's the money right there. It's a proof of the kill. We sat in that bar for two hours talking about the phenomenon. Those boys asked a hundred questions, and I tried to answer every one of them. I even told them a story or two about other Squatch hunts. And after I could see they were satisfied, I paid the tab, and we walked back out to the parking lot. And soon, it was only Matt and I left. Say, Matt, that was some real good shooting out there tonight. You think you could do this again? We need another good shot with us on these hunts. You're deadly with that Model 700. Two headshots at 100 yards in the dark, only five seconds apart. Look, brother, there's good money in this. We could use you now and then. What do you think? Matt looked at the ground for a minute and then raised his head. I couldn't see his eyes under the brim of his ball cap. Are you shitting me, Steve? Three hours ago, I didn't even believe in Bigfoot. It was all just a big joke. Then tonight, I killed two of them. The damn heads are in your truck. Matt pointed at the bed of my truck. And they stink, too. Oh, brother, wait two days. They smell a lot worse, I said, grinning. Matt went on. I need to get my head wrapped around this and ask a few details. And I can't even think of what to ask right now. So count me as a maybe. Maybe not full time. I'm not going to give up my job here to hunt these things. Oh, I hear you, Matt. There ain't no rush to make a decision. You have my number. Holler when you think of some questions. I'll answer them best I can. Hey, Steve, speaking of my job, that whole escapade we just did, it was all filmed on our security cameras. I'm not sure how I'm going to explain this one. Hell, I may not even have a job next week. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one, brother. Look, no one's going to talk about what they saw on that video. If they do, they'll be labeled as a nut job. I guess you'll have to handle it best you can. Hook and I sure didn't expect things to go this way. It should have been an easy in and out job. Hell, you fellas weren't even supposed to know. Yeah, I understand, said Matt. I'll come up with something. We are the best damn crew they have. And in reality, we didn't do anything against company policy. I don't remember reading anything about killing big feats in the employee handbook. Maybe we'll be okay. All right, let me know how it goes, will you? I said. Yep, said Matt. We shook hands and we left the parking lot. Now I went back to the hotel room and I slept like a hammer that night. The next morning after breakfast at the Waffle House, Hook and I drove to the woods and walked to the nest where we had seen the clan on the satellite. We did find human remains in that nest, mainly bones. Well, I called it into my handlers. They would take things from there. It may have been a hairy night with these creatures, but it was worth it. We may have saved people's lives. Driving out of the field, heading home, We saw something in the distance on that gravel road. When we got closer, that old brindle mama dog was standing on the ditch bank, wagging her tail, looking straight up at big old Hook Johnson. He stepped out and started loving on that dog. They both instantly fell in love with each other. Call Matt and ask him if those puppies are weaned off their mother, said Hook. I knew what he had on his mind. I hung up the phone. I told him that she had left the puppies and they were all healthy and still eating lunch meat from lunchboxes. 
Furthermore, they had every puppy a home, and they would all be gone by the end of the week. Okay, then, tell Matt I'm taking this dog home, said Hook. He opened the passenger door, allowing the dog to jump in. And when Hook sat down, her tail about beat him to death because she was on me licking my face. And then she turned to him, her savior, and she laid across his lap. I think she loves you, Hook. What's her name? Her name's Angel, he said. She is my angel. Yes, she is, I said. Hook Johnson, Angel, and I drove back to Memphis that afternoon, and we waited for the next mission. The day after this event, Matt pulled through the gate at the mill to start his shift. It had gotten cold finally. When the guard at the gate stopped him and motioned for him to roll down his window, Matt didn't want to let the heat out of his truck. Reluctantly, he did, and the guard walked over. The guard held out a small regular letter size envelope, and inside it was an SD card. What's this? Matt asked. Our cameras malfunctioned last night right after your shift got off. But here are all the videos from each camera looking back toward the river. I thought you might want these. Well, thanks, Charlie, Matt said. Charlie, the security guard, nodded and smiled. Matt went to work. <laughs> 